Asa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Asa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahudi Sammyao Santo Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa by Qian Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu. Wo Jin Jian Wan de Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, Shifu Shangren, Goei Shishong, how are you today? Time, the calendar. What we're here to do today is uh, listen to the Flower Garden Sutra, and I'm very pleased to be able to be the, the voice that the sutra borrows, I hope, if, I'm, if I could uh, aspire to that and uh, reflect accurately the principles of the sutra. So today, uh, we're doing something special, which is we are reading the first stage of the 10 stages chapter. Uh, we've been explaining and lecturing on the text, going very slowly line by line, and when we got to the end of this 10th stage, we realized that many people, uh, when you go that slowly, lose the track, lose the, the feel of the text as a text. And so you don't get the stories, you don't get the principles, you don't get the language of the text, especially now that it's in English. So we thought, what a valuable uh, gift we have to give if we can listen to the text as literature. And what this allows me to do, because we're not following the strict formal uh, traditional way of, of explaining, um, we're pretty much free to go into the ideas. So uh, I've done that. And today is the fivefold fears and their antidotes. So we're gonna look at the text of the first stage called the stage of happiness and the Bodhisattva talks a lot about where happiness comes from. But then, uh, because of that happiness, fear goes away, which in itself is an interesting idea that somehow you can't simultaneously be happy and afraid at the same time. So he, uh, the, the Buddha, through our spokesperson, whose name is Treasury of Vajra, the Buddha talks about fear. And f the five basic fears from the Buddha's point of view is something definitely we can learn about. And then he tells us uh, where that fear, uh, how, to, how to make it go away, how to banish fear. All right, that's what we're about today. Here's our text. 
and I'm going to zoom up to the top and then come back to 23. All right. Okay, here it is. Um, we're going to invoke the presence of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas with a melody. strings. Imagine that. Back to page 23. I'd like to express gratitude to the volunteers who make these texts available in these beautifully laid out bilingual versions so we can pick whichever language we want to, to study from. Um, yeah, let's, let's see here. We're going to step back to a passage we, uh, we're going to re, we're going to read again a passage that we read last week because it's the, the Buddha's description of where his happiness comes from. Okay. Is that big enough? Can everybody see that? I hope. Okay, here we go. Fozi Pusa Chu Huan Shi Di Chang Jiu Do Huan Shi Do Jing Xin Do Ai Yao Do Shi Yue Do Xin Qing Do Yong Yue Do Yong Meng Do Wu Do Zheng Do Wu Nao Hai Do Wu Chen Hun. Disciples of the Buddha, when bodhisattvas are established on the stage of happiness, they feel abundant happiness, abundant pure faith, abundant delight, abundant bliss, abundant elation, abundant enthusiasm, and abundant courage. They are increasingly free from contention, increasingly free from troubling, and increasingly free from anger. Okay, just a comment here. Um, People don't automatically associate Buddhism with happiness. There's kind of the sense of it's all suffering all the time, and it's, uh, that's a mistake. Uh, when you see the images, look at the Buddhas behind me, for example. If I were to uh, uh, put the screen down, let's see. There we go. Do I have to, uh, let's see, there we go. You can see me there. Uh, see the Buddhas, they don't look upset, they don't look nervous, they don't look worried, they don't look troubled or afflicted, right? That uh, Buddhas are somehow serene, 
And as it says here, uh, all these kinds, bodhisattva on the first stage feels happiness, faith, delight, bliss, elation, enthusiasm, courage, contention, free from contention, free from trouble, free from anger. I like the notion that uh, this, the Buddha is so in touch with the possibilities of emotion. Fear is an emotion, happiness is an emotion. He's so tuned into this. It's not that he doesn't have emotion at all, or that somehow as a Buddhist you're supposed to be a wooden block or, or a, piece of, a piece of cement or somehow that doesn't have any feelings. Not at all. Um, in fact, you have thoroughly entered all emotions and emptied them out so that they, you've taken them to their source and I saw Master Hua cry on numerous occasions and you could feel how happy he could be too when he saw a child uh, memorizing a sutra or something or, or uh, pleasing their parents. He was happy. Uh, but by emptying out those emotions you get to a place beyond emotion where they're, they're yours to experience or, or not but you're not controlled by them. Look how happy bodhisattvas are, abundantly happy, abundantly blissful. And then, because this is the Avatamsaka Sutra, we get everything in tens, it runs out of ways to say happy, and then it does the opposite. Freedom from things that are happiness is up and opposite. Freedom from contention means fighting. They don't fight. That's it's funny when I saw this. It said that duo wu do zheng, why did I see husbands and wives? I don't know. Uh, so you're not dojong. I guess because your companions are the people you fight with. Free from trouble. No nao hai. They're just not into affliction as a lifestyle, which is hard to do, especially in a time when there's so much trouble outside the door, uh, when there's pandemics, and when there's climate disruption, and when there's economic disruption and all, uh, and political storms, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to be free outside, but inside the Bodhisattva is free from trouble and free from anger, which is, of course, a poison. All right, so we got that part. This is, we're into the stage of happiness. Did we all, the first time through, did we all see that? Did we all pick up on how happy uh, a Buddhist can be, particularly a Bodhisattva, particularly a Buddha? Uh, yeah, it's, it is uh, not choked, it's not pinched, it's not narrow, it's not stingy. Abundant happiness is big, big happy. So I want to people who take their cultivation as somehow uh, a sentence to be gloomy, to be tight and scornful of anyone who's not, you know, taking it so seriously. When I see Buddhists who come in with a storm cloud on their brow, I just want to say, I'm not quite sure whose dharma you're cultivating, but it's not the Buddha's dharma. <laughs> that's, that's your own particular attachment of the moment. Right, so let's, let's see if we can't work on letting it go. Now, okay, so that's the abundant. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? Next passage. Fozi pusa zhu zi huan xi di, nian zhu fo gu sheng huan xi. Nian zhu fo fa gu sheng huan xi. Nian zhu pusa gu sheng huan xi. Nian zhu pusa heng gu Okay, we did this last week, but, and I particularly outlined the text this way, I highlighted the text so you could pick up the current, the, the principle here. Disciples of the Buddha, when bodhisattvas rest here on the stage of happiness, they feel happy because they recall the Buddhas. They feel happy because they recall the Buddhist dharmas. 
they feel happy because they recall the bodhisattvas. They feel happy because they recall bodhisattvas' practices. They feel happy because they recall the purity of the paramitas. They feel happy because they recall the supremacy of the bodhisattva stages. They feel happy because they recall the bodhisattva's indestructibility. They feel happy because they recall the Tathagata's teaching and transforming of living beings. Sources of happiness for a bodhisattva and by extension us, should we choose to pick them up. If we recall, if we use our minds this way to think about and remember and bring back, bring up, refresh uh, our experience of Buddhas and we're in a time after the Buddha has entered Nirvana, so we don't get a living, breathing Buddha. Uh, but the, our minds, when, they get, when they're made pure, um, even for a second, the Buddha shines in your mind. And when you think about it, it's like, yeah, I remember that was, I felt really good. <laughs> I was really happy at that point. There was nothing else there except this shining light and a sense of connection with something ancient and kind. Something very old and very kind. And I'm happy when I think of that. That's happiness. It's just to fill your mind with that sense of completely present, completely accepted, and completely in sync with the world around. Because there's no difference between my mind and all that I perceive. So. Recalling the Buddha's dharmas, which are what? It's an uh, operating manual for the universe. What are the Buddha's dharmas? It's how things work. Beyond my thinking about it and beyond my words. So beyond words and thought, how the universe is built, that's the Buddha's dharmas. And it's operating instructions. It's how to affect it, how to make it better, how to purify the self that gets in the way how to get rid of any affliction and greed on top of it or defilement. And man, if you can see that, ah, I'm, I'm a person who uh, I like language and I always enjoyed grammar uh, when I learned Chinese. Uh, Chinese is a remarkable language to study because it's very light on grammar. Not, it doesn't have declensions, doesn't have tense, doesn't have gender. In, you know, ta, chiu shi ta. When, when you know, uh, if you have a Chinese friend, uh, you can hear their struggles with English because she and he are, you, you can see the, your Chinese friends having to switch it. They'll often say she when it's a man and he when it's a woman because why? Chinese has no gender. Ta, chiu shi ta. Ta, ta, man, from, it's all ta, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's really fun to, whenever I met grammar, it was like I had a handle on one of the levers of social interaction and culture, grammar, how language works. That was so neat to see the patterns of grammar. How do you make a past tense? How do you make agreement, nouns agreement? Is it plural? Hmm, Chinese doesn't have plurals. Ji <laughs> ge, right? How many? Niao is a bird, or birds, doesn't matter, you know. Lu is a deer, or deers. So, yeah, in English, oh man, our roots in Anglo-Saxon and, and uh, Latin, wow. So Sanskrit, Sanskrit is a grammarian's delight. Whew. So they feel happy because they recall the bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are perfected people. And when you meet somebody who does bodhisattva's practices, you feel spontaneously high because you see selflessness. Why do we love stories of heroes? Because selfless. It's just like, yeah, for that moment, our mind goes whoosh, and we're bigger. That's, that's happy. Okay, what else? Happy because they recall bodhisattva's practices, which are the tools which, when applied to a person, turns a person into a sage. That makes you happy when you see it. 
happy because you realize the purity of the paramitas. The paramitas are these power tools that bodhisattvas use. There's six of them and ten of them, and they're uh, ways to cross over. They're like bridges from samsara and all its suffering over affliction all the way to nirvana, where suffering ends. Those are the paramitas. They are ways across, ways to cross over. Happy when they recall bodhisattva stages, how supreme they are. This is the high road to the real path of bodhisattvas. Bodhisattva's indestructibility. You get to that place where the mind has no more coverings and there's nothing, nothing preventing it from shining. Right? Just the same way that the sun comes through the clouds, sunlight is indestructible. <laughs> you can block it, you can dim it inside something, put something between you and the sun, but the sun shines and the, the bodhisattva's nature shines when, once it's uncovered. Then when they think of how the Buddhas, thus come on as a Buddha, how they teach and transform beings, how they teach us, uh, there's happiness there. Furthermore, they feel happy when they, because they recall the ability to benefit living beings, they feel happy because they recall how to enter the thus come one's wisdom and expedient means. Um, I don't know what the ability to benefit, at what age does a, does a kid become an adult? Or at what moment in someone's life do they become an adult? And they kind of, they step into the adult's world, out of the world of childhood. It's one of, the, one of those times is when a small human being sees the happiness that results from giving a gift instead of getting all the time. What do kids do? Kids want, I want it, I want it, I want it. That's mine. I can't wait for my birthday because I'm going to get this. Christmas, I'm going to get that. Guonian, I'm going to get a hongbao on New Year's. I'm going to get a red envelope from grandma. You know, I want it, I want it. That's a child's mind. The adult's mind is when that young person, for the first time, sees the joy that comes to them as a giver, as a donor, as a benefactor to someone else. When that someone else receives a gift and, and it's just like, you know, that's a step into adulthood. So for, if you think about Guanyin Bodhisattva, for example, there's a Bodhisattva, those thousand hands, you see the, the Guanyin with a thousand hands, those hands are tools for giving. So how much happiness does Guanyin Bodhisattva generate by using those hands to give, right? The ability to benefit living beings. So, happy because they remember how to enter uh, that word ru over here, this word, this word here, to ru, that word in Chinese, can mean enter, but it can also mean to master in the sense of you merge with, you become one with, you integrate into uh, the thus come one, the Tathagatas, the Buddhas, wisdom and expedient means. In other words, you become a, a teacher yourself. Bodhisattvas recall that and they go, I'm happy, I'm happy, happy. Okay, sources of happiness. Let's, let's do that one more time. What makes you happy? Putting the Buddhas in your mind, putting the Dharmas of the Buddha in your mind, putting the bodhisattvas in your mind, bodhisattvas practices, the paramitas, purity, bodhisattva stages, supremacy, indestructibility of bodhisattvas, and Buddha's teaching of us, the ability to benefit and merging with the Buddha's wisdom, happy. Okay, there it is. That's what, that's a the Abhatamsaka Sutra's description of what makes you happy. And my goodness, we, um, we spend so much time of our lives pursuing happiness and running from pain. 
pursuing pleasure, running from pain, and almost never quite getting it. You know, it's always where you get it and it wasn't what you wanted. They talk about the eightfold sufferings, the eight kinds of suffering. There's that one that's called seeking and not getting. But there's, there's actually, you could do nine, which is seeking and getting and realizing, oh, it's not really what I wanted. You know, I got it. I ordered it online. Amazon delivered it in 48 hours because I got Amazon Prime. And when it arrived, it was like really disappointing. It wasn't what I wanted. So seeking and getting is a ninth suffering. So, so much of our lives is that way. And it just doesn't hit the spot because it's still shen wai wu. It's still something outside. It's external. And happiness happens in the mind. So the bodhisattva's got that down. He's, he's good at that. And so uh, he's, he's figured that out long ago. And so for the bodhisattva, he remembers things, recalls, nian. That actually that verb for nian, same verb to recall, is the same word for mindfulness. It's, you are mindful of. In other words, you fill your mind with the Buddhas, Buddha's dharmas. The benefit, the ability to benefit others. What a joy. Imagine if, uh, you, if you could get your wish. What is your wish? Well, my wish is to be able to give to others in a way that they want. Something that, that really hits the spot for others. Wow. To have that wish means you're going to be happy. If you say, what do you want? I want to be happy. Mm, well, what do you want? Well, I want the ability to get happy through giving. That is the source of joy. So I want to be able to fill my mind with the highest aspirations of humanity here. Doesn't, and, and interesting, I want to make a comment on my comment, which is, this is religion? Is this, did people come to the lecture today thinking you're going to go to church, our Sunday church here uh, at the lecture hall of Gold Coast Dharma Realm online, Dharma Realm Live? Isn't that funny? Because this is, this is religion, isn't it? But what are we talking about? We're talking about the core of being alive. Why are you living? Why am I alive? What's your purpose? Well, get happy. Good. How are you going to do it? Uh, get a lot of stuff? <laughs> Make a million bucks, a billion bucks now? Uh, get an offshore tax shelter so I can avoid any kind of, uh, you know, I can, if I can't buy a politician to put in legislate tax cuts, maybe I'll just have to figure out a way to manipulate the tax code so I don't have to pay any tax. I'll be happy. <laughs> Meanwhile, your lawyers who set it all up for you are sneaking around. Yeah, no, no, nope, that won't do it. So here we are looking at a religion, I suppose, but it's way more hands-on. It doesn't, you don't have to put on a tall hat to, to get the, the value, the good part of Buddhism. Uh, you don't even have to be religious, right? All you have to do is purify the mind and open and unlock all of the treasures inside. They're already there. And the Dharma is instructions, <laughs> how to. Okay, more, more Bodhisattva stuff. Why? Here, look at the becauses. Because, because, because. Why do you feel happiness? Because, what is it? What's the reason? Fu zuo shi nian, wo zhuan li yi qie shi jian jing jie gu sheng huan qi. Qin jin yi qie fu gu sheng huan qi. Yuan li fan fu di gu sheng huan qi. Jin zhi hui di gu sheng huan qi. Yong duan yi qie e qi gu sheng huan qi. Yu yi qie zhong sheng zuo yi zhi chu gu sheng huan qi. Jian yi qie ru lai gu sheng huan qi. Sheng fu jing jie zhong gu sheng huan qi. Ru yi qie pu sa ping deng xing zhong gu sheng huan qi. 
Okay. More of these. They also think, I feel deep happiness because I've turned from and abandoned mundane states. I feel deep happiness because I draw near to all the Buddhas. I feel deep happiness because I've left behind the states of ordinary people. I feel deep happiness because I'm near the stages of wisdom. I feel deep happiness because I leave behind all the evil destinies forever. I feel deep happiness because I'm a place of reliance for all living beings. I feel deep happiness because I see all the thus come ones. I feel deep happiness because I experience the states of Buddhas. I feel deep happiness because I enter into all the bodhisattvas' impartial nature. Okay, stop there. Yeah, this is another level. This is kicking it up. This is graduate school for happiness, sources of happiness. I've turned away from and abandoned mundane states. Which would be what? A uh, mundane state would be heading to the casino for fun. Las Vegas at one point, Las Vegas, Nevada in the United States is a home of lots and lots of casinos along with Reno, Nevada and uh, Lake Tahoe as well. And um, there was a point where uh, Las Vegas uh, Chamber of Commerce met to change their image because people had associated Las Vegas with the mafia, with organized crime. It was a heavy duty place where there was just lots of sin, it was Sin City, right, Sin City. So they thought, no, this, we're gonna lose our appeal. We're just not, you know, not everybody wants to come to Sin City. So what did they do? They rebranded, rebranded Las Vegas as America's Playground <laughs> for family fun, where you go for family fun. America's Playground, by golly. It's where America goes to play. Mmm. <laughs> so I'll, we, uh, on the pilgrimage, uh, three steps, one bow up the coast of California. Um, we, uh, myself and my companion, uh, at just, where was it? North of Pacifica, which is one, of, it's the greater Bay, San Francisco Bay Area. You run into the Golden Gate Recreation, uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area. So it's one of the largest uh, accumulated national parks in America. It includes the Presidio, a decommissioned military base, place where thousands and tens of thousands of Americans left the continent to head to war in Asia from the Presidio. That's part of the, gold, the GGNRR, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, GGNRA. Uh, where else? Uh, the beaches, the Great Highway and the beaches there, and then across the Golden Gate into Marin County where uh, there's Fort Baker, another decommissioned military fort, and uh, a national seashore, and it's, it's marvelous. So the Golden Gate Recreation Area is huge, huge, huge. And so as we slowly, slowly made our way up the coast, um, the rangers picked us up. And they, they're a police force, but their, their job is to protect the, the, the park and protect the people who come to the, the long, uh, diverse Golden Gate National Recreation Area. So we got to know some of the rangers. And uh, one of them was his name, I think it was Rick, Ranger Rick. And the other one was uh, uh, Jeff. And Rick thought we were great. He, he had bright red hair and he's Irish Catholic and he's like, you know, he was impressed that somebody was still doing pilgrimages. And his buddy Jeff, his colleague Jeff, thought we were the devil incarnate. He didn't approve of us. And he, uh, he would drive by and you could just feel the, the, you know, watching us out the window and thinking, I wish these guys would get out of here. So uh, one day, we, so we passed through the San Francisco, crossed the bridge, we got instructions. The Golden Gate Bridge is part of the, the recreation area under their, their police force. So uh, we got to the other side and uh, 
Rick came out and said, hey, oh, I got a story for you. He says, you know, remember my buddy Jeff? He didn't like you. He thought, he, you know, he thought the sooner you got crushed by a bus, the better. And he, he told me a story. And he has had a change of heart. <laughs> Here's the story. He, he uh, said I, uh, he came in to, to, the, to work. We were at, at our, our office. And, and I noticed he'd, he had a chipped tooth and he had a black eye. And he looked pretty rough. I said, what happened to you? He says, oh, went to Las Vegas. <laughs> went to Las Vegas. And, well, what happened to you? He says, everything happened to me. He said, but the strangest thing, he said, let me tell you, I know you, these, these, those monks out there, you talk to them, right? He said, well, um, from Pacifica North, I would drive by them all the time, and something just pressed my button. I thought, what are they doing? How could somebody do that with your life, just bowing down, putting your nose in the gutter over and over and over? What's the point of that? He said, that was the way I just, I felt, and I, I couldn't get past it. And I would go by, and I would just, in my mind, I was like cursing them and, and thinking, what a waste of a life. Why don't they get happy? I mean, there's so much in the world, you know. So I just thought that. And uh, he says, you know, I, I went with uh, uh, Evelyn up to, to, Las, to, to, uh, to Las Vegas, I went to Vegas over the weekend. And you know what? He says, I, I, uh, we packed the trunk with alcohol and... Uh, had took money out of the bank for for gambling and were really ready to live it up and sure enough I drank too much and I fought with my best friend who drove up to with us and we had a fist fight I lost a tooth and he blacked my eye then I I had an accident with the car and I lost my wallet and I was like in there and the gambling tables, I like to do Keno and Blackjack, he said, it seemed so pointless because even though it was supposed to be fun, he says, everything went wrong. This is the worst vacation of my life. <laughs> so I came back and don't you know, on the way back, I drove by those two monks and there they were doing that same thing. But as I looked at them, they looked so peaceful. He said they hadn't changed a bit. They were just like the same they had been before, but somehow they looked different. And he says, maybe I was just seeing it wrong from the start. <laughs> maybe I need to think about this again. So Rick says, so I just wanted to tell you, you, uh, you touched Jeff, he said. <laughs> so whatever you're doing. And he said, here, here, my wife baked some brownies for you. So, so we had uh, a good connection with, the, uh, with the, the police force at the Golden Gate National Recreation. And... So the point of that is mundane states, mundane states. For, for Jeff, the park ranger, uh, he was able in, in a weekend to take another look at America's playground and what, what is essentially a way of separating people from their money by giving them promises of wealth and happiness that can turn out. I know there are people who love Reno, love Las Vegas, but it's a mundane state. And when your money's gone and when, you're <laughs> when, the, when the funds run out, you have to look somewhere else to get the happiness. So the Bodhisattva feels deep happiness because he's abandoned mundane states. He gets close to the Buddhas. He leaves the states of ordinary people He's now into the states of sages, meditation, for example, or the joy of giving. He's now near to the stages of wisdom, but notice this is the first stage. He's near them, he hasn't climbed them. The, the whole road is ahead of him now. He's got nine more stages to experience. Leaves behind the evil destinies. Now this one is so interesting, because I don't, I get to see the, the here, I'm gonna show you my desktop, y'all see the desktop. Here's uh, a, uh, one of the evil destinies, <laughs> the destiny of birds. This is a kookaburra family taken from my, my deck. And this morning, the bird on top, this, this one here, this is uh, 
Calvin, Calvin Kookaburra. And Calvin uh, dropped by on the railing this morning because he didn't get any, he didn't come by for food yesterday and he was hungry. And he's, I was walking down the deck and he plopped right in front of me and looked me right in the eye with that beak. And it couldn't have been more clear that he was hoping I would feed him. So I watch him interact with his sister and his parents every day. That's the whole family, his, his sister and his father and mother. And bit by bit, because the children from their, the two young birds from their earliest time have never been afraid of us because we fed the parents and they would take the ham, the veggie ham, and fly it over and feed the babies. And so he's had that flavor in his beak ever since he started to fly. So, but the parents kept a distance. It's funny, that generation, they didn't want to get close. But now because the kids are fearless and sit right beside us, the parents are coming in. So now we're, we're not as scary, we humans. So here we are, an evil destiny. Well, compared to, comparatively, yes, because why? Life as a bird is not what Walt Disney wants us to think of. Bambi and Thumper and the, you know, Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, they're cartoon characters. Their lives are nasty, brutish, and short. Indeed, the life of an animal. Um, I found a website recently called uh, can I can I do this? Is there, I'm not gonna. We're, we're gonna get to Facebook later. Um, animal clock. There it is, right there. This is something I just found yesterday. United States animal kill clock. Thirty nine thousand seven hundred twenty two. Thirty nine billion seven hundred twenty seven two hundred fifty seven six thirty. <laughs> Animals have been killed for food this year in the United States. U.S. animal death stats. Chickens, and you can see these numbers grow. Chickens, turkeys, cattle, pigs, ducks, sheep, fish, and shellfish. Um, and there's inspiring quotes with these horrible pictures. Uh, the time will come when men such as I will look upon the murder of animals as they now look upon the murder of men. In their behavior towards creatures, all men are Nazis. Human beings see oppression vividly when they're the victims. Otherwise, they victimize blindly and without a thought. You have just dined, and however scrupulously the slaughterhouse is concealed in the graceful distance of miles, there is complicity. Okay, you get the point. So, Animal Clock is a powerful uh, website to bring home the reality of the evil destinies. So the fact that I'm living here in a forest in the bush of Australia, southeastern Queensland, where uh, in the morning, we're in the springtime now, so heading into summer, when you step out, there's a symphony of bird sounds. We're surrounded by all these voices, wonderful creatures here. So I'm aware of them. I am not, however, from moment to moment, aware of the destiny of ghosts. I'm not, from moment to moment, aware of the destiny of the hells. Uh, and yet, the Buddha is. And Buddha's teaching, he, you, the, the, Buddha, the way the Buddha presents life in a body or life in a consciousness is kind of like the crescent moon. If you look at the moon, we're so much in the habit of looking only at the bright part. But if when you look at the moon, if you refocus your eyes, you can see the little corona of the whole moon. So there's the dark side is visible to you even when it's not a full moon. If you're in the habit of doing that little refocusing, you realize that the entirety of the moon is always visible, it's always there, but we are in the habit of looking at the bright part. When you look at a rose or a flower on a stem, how, how many of us look at the stem or the leaves or the thorns, much less the roots? 
No, we look at the blossom, right? We want the blossom of the flower. That's the pretty part. But you don't get the blossom without the stem. You don't get the pretty moon without the presence of the, the penumbra, the, the moon, the dark side, the dark part. So likewise, the Buddha, when he talks about life, also talks about death because it's not apart from life. The three evil destinies are going strong right this minute. We see the animals. We don't see the ghosts that much. Uh, Master Hua guarantees us that the ghost realm is a bureaucracy. It's just so complex with all these levels of, of status, and it's mostly oppressive. It's very vertical. Bosses and slaves, right? Generals and soldiers. So um, the hells in the Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra and other places, the Buddha described them as going full steam, full speed. So that's one reason to study the Buddha's teachings is he expands our awareness of the way things are. The hells are going. The ghost's realm is going. The animal's realm is going. We don't see the devas either. We don't see the heavens, plural heavens. And yet, Buddha says, yeah, devas are right there, right this minute. They're totally right there, all the different levels of the heavens. And even though our eyes don't see that part of the visible light spectrum, perhaps, if that's how you think of it, um, there's no doubt that they're there. So the Bodhisattva feels happiness because he leaves the evil destinies behind and yet he's aware of them. He's not compelled by his karma to stay stuck as a ghost, to stay stuck in a bird's body, right? So happiness, happiness because living beings can depend on him, happy. Happiness because the Buddhas are visible Happiness because the Buddha's states now more are appearing in the mind. Happiness because this bodhisattva merges with, enter into, masters that Buddha's impartial nature. What liberation, what freedom to be part of something that has no limits. It just goes and goes and goes. And it's kind. It's not harmful. Happiness, yeah, I'll go for that. I like that. Can I have more of that, please? Okay, here we go. Are we ready? I promised this, and we're, we have time to do it. Here we go. 原理一切不畏毛树等事故生还起何以故此菩萨得欢喜地以所有不畏悉以悉得原理所谓不活畏给施几施一切众生何况有圣事故无有大众威德位菩萨如是原理经不毛树等事 lot that's a long one but this is the, the this is what we're what we came for I feel deep happiness because I've left behind all alarming hair raising and terrifying experiences far behind why is this so it's so because once bodhisattvas attain the stage of happiness, they leave behind all fears. Fears such as not staying alive, fear of a bad reputation, fear of death, fear of the evil destinies, fear of the virtue of the great assembly. They abandon all such fears forever. And why? It's because these bodhisattvas are free from the thought of self. 
They don't even cherish their own bodies, how much the less wealth and possessions. Therefore, they have no fear of not staying alive. They do not seek offerings from others, but only give to other living beings. Therefore, they have no fear of a bad reputation. They've left the view of self far behind. They have no thought of self. Therefore, they have no fear of death. They themselves know that after death, they will certainly not be apart from the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Therefore, they have no fear of the evil destinies. Their intent and inclinations in all worlds are unequaled, how much the less surpassed. Therefore, they have no fear of the virtue of the great assembly. Bodhisattvas, in that way, leave all alarming, hair-raising, terrifying experiences far behind. Yes, here we go. I put it, not that, put that back. Um, oh, all right, gotta go find it. Here we go. Gotta move that there. All right. I feel deep happiness. Okay, why is this so? Check it out. This first fear when bodhisattvas get the stage of happiness, they leave behind fears. Fears such as, this one right here, not staying alive. That never made sense to me. I was always, hmm, yeah, well, how's that different than death? Well, turns out, if I'm not mistaken, as a translator, it's fear of not having a livelihood. So it's, I have no livelihood. I have no way of supporting myself and my loved ones. I don't have money to buy food. I don't have a place to buy food. I live in Oakland, California, and the closest grocery store is three miles away, but I can go down to the liquor store and buy a Hostess Twinkie for a dollar and a half, and that's lunch, you know, or dinner. Yeah, man. I have no way to get through the days and support myself and others. That is a fear. That's frightening. That's terrifying. People who would never ever think of committing a crime when it comes to doing what they have to do to find food for grandma, for their spouse, for their kids, they will do things they wouldn't do otherwise because why? It's your responsibility to keep people alive. That's a motivator, that's a fear, okay? So, interesting, that's the first one. That's the one the Buddha puts first, fear. So, what's the antidote? Because these bodhisattvas are free from the thought of self, no thought of self. They don't even cherish their own bodies. They don't abuse them, but they don't cherish them. They're not that priceless. How much the less do they cherish wealth and things. So that fear of having no livelihood is gone. Okay, I made that red because I want to stop right there briefly. That is key to the Buddha's entire project. If we want to say what is it that the Buddha did, they, they call it D-E-E-D, -E -E -D, truth in the ultimate sense. The primary truth is the Buddha saw through the illusion, the illusion of the self, this compound self, this thing that is so important inside my, inside my head, my life. Everything is for me, 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 me and mine. And wow, you, if you think, you know, how about an elected official who is defeated at the polls and then says, no, I didn't. It's not possible that I'm no longer president. I'm still president. Me, I, everything, you know. You go, eh, sir, a mm, little less self. You play fair, just play, play by the rules, play fair, just like everybody. You and everybody, same. Not different, not higher, not lower, just the same. And nope. So we go so wrong with this view of the self. The self is so important, so central, so 
they call it a hegemony. It's, it's the boss inside. And the self inside our minds is a cruel ruler, a cruel emperor. It, he only wants to survive. Even our siblings, we, people, children who we grew up with, are the same parents. The me is the most important one, right? It's a fear to think that we could do, that, that somehow outside of the self, it's okay. In fact, it's freeing and liberating. We go away from fear if we can see through the self. It's freedom from fear when we see through the self. So that's, wow, this, this is so, I, I'm, I took time. I, I said, basically, we're reading the sutra, right? But I thought, wow, these fivefold fears here in the first stage of the Avatamsaka are so powerful. And the Buddha gives us this antidote. So they don't cherish their own bodies, wealth and possessions. They can use wealth. They can use possessions. They don't, they're not like St. Francis who said, give away your sandals, give away your walking stick. St. Francis was an extremist. Boy, St. Francis, nobody could renounce like Francis of Assisi. Uh, so he's not that. That's, St. Francis was a zealot seeking experience with God and had stigmata grow on his hands up there in the mountain. You know that part of the story? St. Francis got Christ's wounds on his hands when he was praying on the mountains. So there was a, some sort of a magical miracle for St. Francis. But uh, these bodhisattvas can use wealth and use possessions. They don't cherish them. They're not attached to them. So getting making a livelihood is not frightening, it's real. They find a way, because of they, mostly because they give, that things come to them. So there's no fear of not staying alive. And anything that others get is their happiness too. They're not afraid of giving to others because that self is gone. Boy, it's just like getting rid of this uh, huge burden on your shoulders when you can get free of the thought of self. Okay, 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 preacher man, move on. Number two, look at this, fear of a bad reputation. What is that? That's called face, means. That's it right there. Oh man, how frightening is it to have your reputation destroyed? Shakespeare said, if you steal my purse, you steal trash. If you steal my good name, you have wounded me grievously. So in uh, parts of the world, if a daughter is promised to the son of another family in marriage and then for some reason it doesn't come through, the daughter's life can be forfeit because she has tarnished the reputation of the family. It's that face is that important. Another word for it is honor, right? Society is built around honor. And wow, what you will do. Um, why, uh, if, you, if it's a traditional Chinese family and their children sitting together with their parents, the younger children do not speak until the elders have spoken. The bigger brother or the parents, you just don't. It's not your position because if you speak wrongly, you dishonor the entire Wang clan, the entire Li clan, the entire Lin clan. You will not risk tarnishing the face, the social standing among peers of the entire family. So super important is this reputation stuff. It's not just you're not famous. No, it has to do with the status of your entire clan. Once dishonored, you, nobody wants to establish guanxi with you. You're, you're not, they're not going to do business. You're done, right? So, wow, the Buddha is giving it to us from before our postmodern understanding of what's important. This is the way society is built for most of the world. Our rugged individualism, the Buddha did not endorse, right? clans. You belong to a family. That's who you are. That's how you stand. So 
You don't want to risk that. But, and people are afraid to do so. He says, no, bodhisattvas aren't. They're not afraid of bad reputation. Why? They don't hope people will give them things. They only exist to give. They are known as generous benefactors. Everybody loves them. We love the person who gives us things that make us happy, right? So that sense of you owe me, you owe me, you owe me praise, you owe me face, that attitude is gone. It's like face, I don't care about face, I just want to give. Reputation, that will come in naturally if I do the things worthy of honor. So the Bodhisattva pays attention to being honorable and lets the reputation follow in itself. If, on the other hand, you run out and you buy what in Chinese are called Ming Pai, brand names. If you are Ming Pai from head to toe, Chanel and Gucci and LV and all the things that, special bags, right? Special clothes, special glasses. Because why? You want a reputation as a wealthy person? You're, you lost it, right? If instead you find ways to make others' lives happy by giving to them without Ming Pai, without famous brands, people look up to you. Your reputation is ensured because you do the things worthy of honor. Okay? So, what a wonderful look. I mean, this is like, this is it, isn't it? This is how you get through the fear. What's next? Number three is... There we are again. Oh, no, number three is death. Fear of death. Mm. This is living beings. They have left the view of self far behind, no thought of self, so no fear of death. This is a lofty state. This is not simple, because it's so clear. Um, here, living in the bush, it's a pretty cruel natural world where things are eaten. Uh, I, I told the story before of seeing this beautiful moth land on my screen door and I was admiring it and it was an unusual moth, not a butterfly but a moth and had different patterns and I was admiring it and I noticed that the Kurawangs had arrived. <laughs> And the Kurwang shows up to get crackers in the morning. And the Kurwang, I was admiring the moth, the Kurwang went zoom, go, no more moth. And I'm like, oh, jeez, oh, just like that. The moth's life came to an end in a blink of an eye. And I was admiring its pattern, and now it's living in the stomach of a big black Kurwang bird. Not as large as a crow, but. So. That's, that's it. That's life here. The fear of death. The bodhisattva is not afraid of dying because in, he has deconstructed, she has deconstructed that illusory self. It's, you're not different from the things around you. And death is a change. It's not an end and the self isn't the limit. This is a hard one. It's hard to, to relate to this one because leaving the view of self far behind is the Buddha's state. It's the Bodhisattva's state. And whew, you think, well, I'm not there yet. I am still so attached to the self. All right, next one. Fear of the evil destinies. We just talked about it. We talked about hells, animals, and ghosts. They themselves know after death they will not be anywhere that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are not. So they're, they're not going to become ghosts. They're not going to fall into the animal's realm. They're not going to become a hell dweller. You know, it says uh, when we take refuge, uh, as has happened here, Everybody, we have five men and, and one of the bhikshunis here. Six of us here have taken refuge with the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And 
the, in the last, at the end of the ceremony, of the refuge ceremony, the taking refuge ceremony, when you become a disciple of the Buddha, it says, um, you, congratulations, you have done something really difficult, you have closed the doors to the evil destinies and opened the doors to humans, devas, and nirvana. So this is uh, no longer need fear falling into the evil destinies because you've joined the Buddhist family. So that's reality, says the Buddha. Yep. Okay, we get to number five, which I think is just a hoot. What is fear of the virtue of the great assembly? In Chinese, it's a funny one. Um, bring it up here. Oops. Shouldn't close it till I'm done. There it is. It's called Da Zhong Wei De Wei. There it is right there. Great assembly, big gathering, the multitudes, awesome. Or it's uh, Wei is like awe inspiring, slightly stern, slightly uh, formal, the virtue. So the Wei De is kind of the, the uh, what do you say? It's your appearance when you've, you're kind of a little bit scary, but, but in a good way. You are august, you're solemn, that's we da. And this is a quality attributed to the assembly, meaning the people in front of you, the, the ones you're about to step onto the stage and talk to. <laughs> so this is your PhD review panel. This is your doctoral committee who are there to, to hear your defense of your dissertation. They're a little awesome. This is the parole board. If you're trying to get back on the street after you know, coming out of incarceration, this is a uh, judge. This is the jury. Um, it's the great assembly, and they have some. They have qualities that's a little bit scary, a little bit intimidating. Now, if we want to make it less dramatic and just say, it's the audience as you're about to sing or step on stage. What is this fear? This fear is called stage fright. This is stage fright. The Buddha says, yeah, one of the five-fold fears is stage fright. And oh my goodness, it's kind of it's almost funny to think that the Buddha would point to this as being something that uh, completely infects, that moves, that can terrify living beings. True, true. Um, there are, uh, how, was it Mark Twain who said, the mind, the human mind is a wonderful thing that, that informs us all our lives and it never leaves us for a moment until we step out on stage <laughs> and then it's gone. We, we start to tremble, our knees knock, our teeth chatter. I've actually seen people have their teeth chatter just before they step on stage. Um, we are, we, our heart beat, our heart rate increases, we sweat, flop sweat is all about stepping on stage. And this is true for athletes. My goodness, we just went through the, the Olympics in Japan and uh, I was imagining, as I was thinking about the, part, the uh, athletes competing, what it's like to just suddenly the moment has come. You've been preparing for this for so long and now is the moment. You're out there and the gun goes off and you, you know, the race begins. And it's scary. It's frightening. And this is all... You could say the great assembly could be the other runners in the 800 meters who are the world's finest. So the Bodhisattva says what? My intent, my inclinations are unequaled. How much the less surpassed my 
Let's see here. The things that I set my heart on and the things that please me, the things that I, that I'm, that I want from the world, things that make me happy, things that, how does it go here? The things, my intent is unequaled. What I'm after, the reason I'm here singing, performing, uh, competing, is I want to give. That's my intent. I'm here to instruct. I'm here to please, entertain. I'm here to do my best for the country, for my club. So nobody can, can fault my motive. Why should I be afraid? Yeah? I teach a class. So bodhisattvas in that way leave alarming, hair-raising, terrifying experiences far behind. I teach a class um, along with my colleague, Steve Boffman, in um, Stage Fright. That's not the name of the class. The name is Music, uh, Meditation, and Performance. And it's a, at a music camp. And the, the people who come, come because they want some tools to overcome da zhong wei de wei that sense of terror and fear before they, before they perform. And before they, so they can share their music without being obstructed by stage fright. That's the reason. And it's very humbling to, I'm, I'm there supposed to be the expert on how to transform that paralyzing fear of stepping in front of people. Then when it's time for me to record in front of a, a microphone, my guitar playing, and I fumble, I freeze. My fingers get double, they get thick. My hand gets cold. And my recording is like awful. And I said, wait a minute, why are you doing this? It's no different. You were rehearsing and a minute ago, nobody was listening, the microphone wasn't on. And yeah, it's real. This is a real, real issue. So. We, in our class, come up with exercises and perspectives and ways to reframe the experience so you're channeling the elements and you're simply setting the strings in motion to vibrate. So this is, that's a physical physics. That's part of nature, having it just vibrate. You're just setting the strings in motion. That vibration is going out and out and out, you know, different ways to look at this whole experience. And some people pick up on it right away. Other people are like, no, it didn't work. So stage fright, real. Stage fright is real. So in the very same sutra, Guan Yin Bodhisattva appears as a guide for Sudana. She is one of his Shan Jirshers, good and wise advisors in chapter 39 called Entering the Dharma Realm. She uh, tells him about what Guan Yin teaches and she teaches 14 kinds of fearlessness. Fascinating, look at this. I'm gonna read it, this is from the Avatamsaka but it's a later chapter. I'm just gonna read it quickly. Li Ri Nao Bu Li Mi Huo Bu Li Ji Ji Fu Bu Li Sha Hai Bu Li Pin Chung Bu Li Bu Huo Bu Li E Ming Bu Li Yu Si Bu Li Da Zhong Bu Li E Chu Bu Li He An Bu Li Yi Qian Yi Bu Li Ai Bie Bu Li Yuan Hui Bu Li Bi Po Shen Bu, Li Bi Po Xin Bu, Li Yu Bei Bu, Fu Zuo Shi Yuan, Yuan Ju Zhong Sheng, Ruo Nian Yu Wo, Ruo Cheng Wo Ming, Ruo Jian Wo Shen, Chie De Mian Li Chie Bu Wei, Shan Nan Zi, Wo Yi Ci Fang Bian, Ling Ju Zhong Sheng, Li Bu Wei Yi, Fu Jiao Ling Fa Ano Do Lo, Sam Yu Sam Fu Ti Xin, Okay, that's Guanyin Bodhisattva's statement to Sudana. Listen here. Interestingly, 
the fivefold fears we just looked at are all packed right in here. Good man, as I cultivate this practice method of great compassion, I vow to save and protect all beings forever. I vow to enable all beings to leave the fear of treacherous paths, to leave the fear of troubling afflictions, to leave the fear of delusion, to leave the fear of being bound and tied, to leave the fear of being killed and harmed, to leave the fear of poverty and destitution, to leave the fear of having no livelihood, to leave the fear of an evil reputation, to leave the fear of death, to leave the fear of the great assembly, to leave the fear of the evil destinies, to leave the fear of darkness, to leave the fear of wandering and drifting, to leave the fear of parting from what you love, to leave the fear of encountering what you hate, to leave the fear of things that oppress the body, to leave the fear of things that oppress the mind, and to leave the fear of worry and anxiety. Guan Yin goes on to say, uh, after I do that, uh, if anybody encounters that fear, just think of my face, see my body in your imagination, recite my name, and you will leave fear behind, says Guan Yin, right there in the sutra. Good man, after I expediently teach people to leave their fear behind, I tell them to make the great resolve for Anuttara Samyaksa. So here's Guan Yin Bodhisattva, who uh, gives us a method, right there in the sutra, to leave fear behind. She says, Recite my name, Guan Yin Bodhisattva. And that's why Guan Yin is called the Bodhisattva who bestows courage. She gives fearlessness to us. So, how about that? That's so interesting. So here we are, Avatamsaka Sutra's 10 stages chapter, the first stage called Five Kinds of Fear and Their Antidotes. This is good. This is good. This is really religion you can use. Yep. Boy, fear is so much a part of our lives from, uh, from what? From apprehension all the way to terror. All the different steps. Slightly nervous all the way to paralyzed with terror. Fear. All these different kinds of words we have in English about being afraid. Wow, we are one of our after 9-11, the uh, homeland security, anti-terrorism, our entire form of government was focused around fear. And we're now sort of coming out from, this in America anyway, coming out from behind that uh, cloud of fear that's been part of our lives for 20 years. So thinking there are other things to take as your organizing principle for government. So, talking about Guan Yin Bodhisattva, I wanted to share a brand new Guan Yin song with us. Uh, so I don't have to scroll. I'm going to get rid of my white spaces here. There we go. Um, the melody is a Christian hymn. But this is one that we can sing. Thousand 
eyes to see me and a thousand ears to hear with a thousand hands to help me Guan Shu appear Namu Guan Yu Bodhisattva Namu Guan Shu You will always come to save us from the troubles that we're in Save all beings if they only call your name With a heart of great compassion Friend to everyone the same No exceptions Bodhisattva From the troubles that we're in That's one you can carry out the door with you. Alrighty. Uh, what have we got? We got some announcements. Announcements, announcements, announcements. Deep Dreaming Australia. A continent of compassion. 21st September, that is when? Two days from now, it's Tuesday. 7 a.m. Australia time, 7 a.m. on the 21st, which is the 20th, right? This is Australia time. The National Day of Compassion starts with a live event, representatives from the Australian and Global Charter for Compassion. You can register if you want to take part in that one hour live event. Then from eight o'clock on, on Facebook, the Charter for Compassion and Charter for Compassion Australia Facebook page, we're gonna go there in a minute. Starting at eight, there are 50 video stories of compassion in action hosted on Facebook throughout the day. Stories include conversations with leaders from cities across Australia, I'm one of them. People applying compassion in the arts, healthcare, business, education, environment, peace, interspirituality. That's the one that we do. Social justice and research. So if, you, if this is something that you think you might be interested in, go to, come back, Charter for Compassion Facebook page. You cannot do kindness too soon, for you never know how soon it will be too late. Here it is. And down here on the left, Tuesday, okay, so it's Tuesday at 2.20. Tuesday at 2.20. Um, join us as we visit our friends in Australia celebrating their first Australian Compassion Council's National Day of Compassion. Australia has become a continent for compassion. In this transmission, watch from the indigenous sector, compassionate cities sector, environmental sector. Part one, indigenous compassionate cities. You just watch part two, peace, research, education. This live session will cover healthcare and interfaith. Uh, something, something, something. So, Deep Dreaming Australia, a continent for compassion. This is new, and our friend Terry Ailing has done a tremendous job getting this organized. So, go out to Facebook if you're interested. Um, I don't know when my section will pop up, but it's going to be. There, anyway, so that's, that's one. Um, then uh, another event is gonna happen and I wish I could tell you where the link is. I don't know unless, last chance here, uh, whether our friend, our organizer has sent it to us in the meantime. 
Uh, not yet. Let's see here. Oh. 九位大和尚跨越三周中秋开始当佛法成为免疫力 There we go um, oh, It's still, let's see YouTube and Zoom links Okay, uh, we got it So I have to do some I have to now shift this over Do a little bit of a switcheroonie here so, uh, let's see here. Does that work? Okay. Then, I need to get better at doing this. It's, on, it's doing the switch in my... To get it, I, I've got the um, image in WeChat, and I've got to get WeChat out onto another... App. Let's see. Download. Save to album. There it is. Okay. Transfer. Yes. Okay. And that means the wonders of technology. Aren't you glad that what I'm trying to do here, folks, is... Um, let you know how Chinese speakers, mind you, because this is limited to the speakers of Chinese. There we are. There it is. That's what I was looking for, right there. Okay, uh, this is, there are nine Buddhist monks from the Chinese Mahayana tradition who are going to be talking about can Buddhism be Dang Fo Fa Cheng Wei Mian Yi Li? Right? Can Buddhism become a, uh, an immune system for humanity? The strength of Buddhist immunity. And those, oh my goodness, they're tiny. Those are the two QR codes one for Zoom, one for YouTube. And uh, in China, uh, because, uh, I, what is it? It's uh, WeChat. WeChat has been so popular. Everybody is used to scanning QR codes. We're learning about it in Australia, too. I did it at the library the other day. But it says, um, we are bringing together monks from three continents and uniting the four Cs to give impressions on how Buddhism can... Uh, explain and deal with coronavirus, our pandemic. Uh, this is Dharma Master Boro, Boro Fasher down in Sydney, is the organizer. And I don't know any way that we can get this out to the audience so they can scan the code. Um, you can't, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an image. So you wanna, if you get up close to your computer screen and scan it right now, <laughs> that's one way to do it, I guess. Anyway, so you have to, it's all in Chinese. And it's happening um, tomorrow at 10 a.m. here on Australian Eastern Standard Time. It's probably, what time is that in, in America anyway? 10 a.m. is... So, okay. Yeah, it's a little bit painful. So, let's see here. 10 a.m. is 5 p.m. Oh, that's not bad. 5 p.m. U.S. So, let you know about that. Okay, two kinds of announcements going on. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jin Chuan, I think Jin Chuan sure is still at Berkeley, to tell us what's going on at Berkeley Monastery. Um, well, any news to report? Yeah, um, actually, I'm here with Jin Wei Shi at Rama yeah. Vihara. Oh, terrific. All right. Yeah, How's so I was going to show a photo. Um, Jerry suggested I show a photo that he helped take of us as a how's, crew. How's the Wi-Fi treating you down there? It's doing okay. We streamed from here for the first day. Our, from evening, ceremony. our evening ceremony. First time oh, streaming from Redwood Vihara. Terrific. So, uh, if you can share screen, Jerry. Oh. Take it away. Can you make me a co-host or? 
screen share. Oh. Looks like I can't share screen. Oh, yes, okay. you're now the co-host. Okay. Here's a photo of the group. Oh, Actually, look at that. Starting. Yeah. Wow. By golly. Yeah. yeah. There's the people. Amid the redwoods. Yeah, in the redwoods. Okay. People uh, will recognize on the far left. There he yeah. is. Alex. Alex. Jasky. Okay. Yoshika and Simon. And in the center is Jin Fu. <laughs> Jin Fu. And Jin Chuan on the right, your right, and then Jin Wei Shi on the left. Yeah. Surrounded by redwood trees. So we officially Lovely. started today for the Rubber okay. Bihara residential retreat. Okay, and it was a great retreat. Start. People are very sincere in, in practicing together. So that's maybe just as an update. As okay. for BBM events, we have a regular program, but our streaming now will be streamed from both Berkeley and Roto Vihara. So our morning ceremonies and programs will be at, Roto v at Berkeley, sorry, at Roto Vihara, and then on Tuesday we'll back, be back in Berkeley. But for those online, it's the same link. You just join in like usual. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, our schedule is the same. So we have, um, if you look at the the website, Stephen Tainer's class, Marty's yeah. class. There we are. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's Wednesday evenings. Marty's class is Friday evenings. Um, we have below that the Great Compassion Mantra Dedication of Marrow, which is the last Sunday of each month from 6.30 to 7.30. Um, keep going down. Okay. Still can fly over to RBU. Join our yep. online, online programs. For okay. sure, lectures on the Universal Door, twelve thirty, and yeah, that's that's our regular program. Still continuing on. Okay, um, can I ask you what microphone you're using right now? We're just using the Jabra. The Jabra, okay, because there's lots of room sound in it, so that's okay. Oh, really? Okay, yeah, that's all right. It, it's 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 sufficient. It's good enough. Okay, well, thank you for that report. Um, Look forward to hearing more from Redwood Bihar. Those photos are terrific. Yeah. Um, I wanted to share, uh, since we're, I mentioned, uh, I'm kind of proud of, this is the young lady who is down here in, in the bigger photo. This is Candace the Kookaburra, Candy Kookaburra. And this is the, the, evil destiny of animals. Evil, we, we think, you know, they're so cute. And we love our golden swamp wallabies, for example. And we think, you know, how evil is that? Well, would you want to be one? Have a furry body like that? You can see the integrity and the intelligence in that, that face, <laughs> she's chewing on grass. Delicious. So, yeah, what, what do you say? Sometimes it's tough just surviving. Here is one of her wallaby mates who, in combat with other male wallabies, lost an eye, lost piece of an ear, has uh, deep scratches in the back. But you think about wallabies, they don't go to war with each other. They don't develop missiles of utter destruction and invest more money in defense than they do in their own health. So yeah, people, I don't know, humanity is, we have to kind of recalculate our priorities There's, there's a little, there's a being inside there, inside that beak and feathers, staring at, staring out at us. So I think with that in mind, um, one of the operating principles that the Buddha would want us to appreciate is the power of kindness. And if we can base our behavior 
in kindness, uh, we are closer to the bodhisattvas. And that's the... Uh, we're gonna, next week, our text talks about that basis in compassion as the beginning, the sine qua non, without which nothing else works. All righty. Uh, let's see here. We've got a... It's an award-winning picture. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, how many folks on YouTube today? Sherry, you can... How are we doing? with 65. 65 from the Chinese side. That's great. All right. 122 on the English side. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining, making the effort to come out. This is our transference of merit, Medicine Buddha's mantra. picture of the Buddhas, so as we bow, we can focus on the Buddhas. This is the city of 10,000 Buddhas before the 10,000 Buddhas images went up. This is an early photo. I invite you to join me if you care to. to the Venerable Master. See you all next week, everyone. Keep reciting those mantras and stay healthy. Omitofo, bye-bye.